think it's uh, 3 p.m. now. I can think we can begin our webinar session for today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to weekly webinar organized by the College of Physician Malaysia. We are in the month of neurology and currently in the week three. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have uh, the speaker for today, Dr. Mahavishnu, and we'll be presenting on the topic of uh, cosmetic neurology, the advances in cognitive neuroscience and neuropharmacology. Uh, and today's chairperson will be Dr. Ahmad Shahir. Uh, just a brief introduction, uh, Dr. Ahmad, he graduated from UKM in 2004. He completed Master in Internal Medicine from the same university in 2012 before pursuing his neurology training under Ministry of Health Malaysia. He had his clinical attachment done in James Cook University Hospital and Newcastle Hospital UK during his training. He is currently uh, Secretary for Malaysia Society of Neurosciences and Treasurer for Malaysia Movement Disorder Council. Without further ado, I welcome uh, Dr. Shakir to the floor. Great. Um, welcome and thank you for uh, everybody for joining us today. And thank you to Dr. Liu for the very kind introduction. So allow me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mahavishnu Sadevan, who is currently a um, consultant neurologist practicing in Hospital Putrajaya. He graduated from Laka Manipal Medical College in year 2005 and competed a master in internet medicine from Kim Kaya in 2017. And then he obtained a fellowship in the European Board of Neurology in year 2021. And also um, completed his fellowship in autoimmune neurology in the field department of clinical neurosciences, University of Oxford, in year 2023. So without further ado, I would like to actually um, call upon Dr. Vishnu to share his knowledge with us today. Over to you, Vishnu. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Shahe. Okay, I'm, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen right now. Give me a small moment. Okay, hang on, hang on. All right, today I'm going to talk about the advancements of cognitive neuroscience and neuropharmacology. And we're going to touch a little bit about cosmetic neurology, which is actually what this is. Just a small disclaimer before I start. This is merely a review of which medicines might improve the body and the brain functions by modulating motor, cognitive, and affective, affective systems. There's no randomized controlled trials which were done in most of this uh, information which I'm going to give you. Uh, these uh, potential quality of life interventions discussed can raise some ethical uh, concerns, uh, some related individuals and other related uh, related to individuals or other related societies. Okay, this talk is not meant to encourage or endorse any individual to use treatments of any sort outside of the clinical guidelines provided by your country or hospital. So that is just me saying that, judge for yourself. Okay, so this talk will feature the types of memory, I'm going to go through that, the neuroanatomy involved in cognition, uh, neuroplasticity and dendrite proliferation. I'm going to tell you what this is. Um, how neurons communicate with one another. And hang on, let me just do something here. Okay. And we're going to look into uh, brain supplements, what works, what doesn't work, what are the um, studies that say it works, uh, what, what's the evidence on that. And finally, we will touch upon cosmetic neurology. And I'll tell you what it is and why it's a rather new field. Okay, so usually 
when I talk about the subject, these are the questions that come up. So we'll try and answer them all. Some of them are, is, is there a smart pill or are there pills that can make you smart? Does music help my memory? If I listen to a little bit of Bach, some Mozart, some Chopin, can I become smart? Will playing chess or maybe Sudoku will help me become smart? So you have a little kid, I'm sending him for chess classes. Will he become a genius or will he become smart? Try and answer that part. Then sometimes people say, I listen to a lot of classical music, so they sound polished. Are they really? Is this, does that really improve their memory? Let's have a look and we'll find out. So are supplements in the market available that can make you smart or improve your cognition in some way or another? And finally, some people ask about exercise. Does that help with your mental faculties? We'll look into that as well. So before we start, let me show you how memory is classified in the brain. Okay, so this is a diagram which just, just roughly tells you about what memory is all about. So if you look at it, it's divided into sensory, short-term and long-term. Sensory memory was actually, this, um, it's subclassified into haptic, echoic and iconic. They're very, very short memories which last about two, three seconds. And it was coined out in 1960 by um, an experiment called uh, Sperling Sensory Memory Experiments. And it was done, and uh, what haptic memory does is uh, something you touch, you can remember. Echoic, something you heard and you remember it. Iconic is something you see. But I'm not going to go so much into detail, because, but just something good to know. Short-term memory or working memory is what we're, we've got to pay a bit of closer attention to. So working memory just allows learning, reasoning, understanding, and the longer a working memory or uh, this sort of memory remains in your head, it gets transferred into long-term memory. And one second here. Pointer, pointer. Okay, and long-term memory, it's divided in explicit into explicit memory, which is episodic memory. Episodic memories are memories you remember in a certain episode in your life. For example, the first day of school or something, a joke you heard, that's an episode, a tragedy that happened. Those are all episodic memories. And it's important to note when a patient gets Alzheimer's, dementia, this is one of the first memories which tends uh, they tend to lose. And below episodic, there's something called semantic memory. Semantic memory is basically general knowledge. So what you've learned, what you've memorized, what you've kept in your mind palace. So that's semantic memory. Then we go to implicit memories, which are something called procedural memory. Proce procedural memory, what's important about this is, um, I'll tell you later a little bit about procedural memory later, but what it's, uh, what is it? It is um, remembering procedures like how to drive a manual car, how to set up a chessboard, how to operate a television set, computer, that's um, procedural memory. Then there's something called associative memory, where you associate things with other things. For example, if you walk into a supermarket, you smell uh, something which smells like Cookies, famous Amos, and you say, yeah, that's famous Amos cookies. So that's associative memories. We're not going to talk so much about this, but it's good to know. Then there's something called non-associative memories, which are things that your body sensitizes itself so that you learn. For example, if you hear thunder for the first time, you're frightened, and later you get sensitized to it, and you know it's not going to harm you, and that's called a, a non-associative memory. And the last one is called priming. Priming is like a defense mechanism, a reminder in your body, in your brain. And this is like, let's say you watch, uh, uh, you've seen some health videos in the past and you're walking around and you notice someone selling cigarettes and you say, no, I remember that this causes cancer and stuff. So that is priming. Your body primes you at all. Oh, if you see a, a live wire, you know not to touch it because you've seen somewhere that it says it's dangerous, so that's priming. So that's how memory is basically classified. So if you're going to look at the anatomy on where it's located, I'll try and be a bit 
grief on this part. So space, uh, pay a little bit of special, a uh, little attention to this part of prefrontal cortex, where this is responsible for working memory. So whenever uh, you're trying to study something or when you're walking or doing something, your prefrontal cortex lights up and working memory starts to work. The longer it works, it goes into your long term. So that's where it's located. Now, if you look at this part, that's where your semantic memory is located, inferior temporal lobe. That's where general knowledge is kept. And if you look at these areas, mainly the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, some parts of the cortex, that's where procedural memory is kept. And funnily, so if you look at this area in the basal ganglia, so you have a patient with a basal ganglia stroke injury, Parkinson's, they tend to lose their procedural memories. And procedural memories, uh, patients tend to do very well in MOCAs and MMSE, so you can't pick them up so easily with conventional tests. So something you need to keep in mind. So in this diagram, you can't see episodic memory. Why? Because it's in the medial temporal lobe. and Episodic memory involves your uh, medial temporal lobe, your hippocampus. Your hippocampus is something which is going to be important again, which I'll come back to why. Because the hippocampus is like the librarian in your brain. It tells you where information is kept. So if you're going to, so you can retrieve it. So that's the main function usually about the hippocampus. So it's in the medial temporal lobe. It, it's involved in episodic memory. Everything around it, the parahippocampal cortex, also is involved in episodic memory. So this is just a brief overview on where those structures are located. Now, coming to something called dendrite proliferation and neuroplasticity. So, the, so on your right is a book called Brain Injury and Recovery. This was written somewhere in the 90s was a little bit controversial when it first came out, but it's become like a textbook to many because it, it coined out what uh, we all talk about now these days, which is called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity, okay, so the neuro, before I go into neuroplasticity, the neuroscience behind uh, what I mean by dendrite proliferation is, okay, when you're born, you've, uh, when you're, your neuron has about 3000 connections which are dendritic connections when you're about three years old. As you grow older, it can extend up to 25,000. So what neuroscience has discovered is that new dendrite spines can be created if you work on it. And that's called plasticity when you're working on it. Your dendrites proliferate, new spines are formed. So there are the two types of neuroplasticity which we need to know. The first type is called functional neuroplasticity, and that involves, uh, let's say you have a damaged area in your brain from a stroke, a traumatic brain injury. Uh, other parts of the brain, try, uh, there's, what happens there is dendrites proliferate to try to recover and get back some of the function that is lost. That's called functional neuroplasticity. The second type is called structural plasticity. So structural plas plasticity is the ability of your brain to become better at itself when you practice something. So looking at uh, just an example of structural plasticity, uh, Einstein's brain for some, from, so has an enlarged area in a certain part, which is involved with um, critical thinking. And that's like 15% bigger and a little bit later. So while people believe, there's a belief that as you age, you're unable to remember your brain strings, you don't, plasticity doesn't occur, but this is not true because studies have shown neuroplasticity can go up and can still carry on at the age of 80. So it just doesn't stop. And right proliferation can keep going on as long as it's you're using that part of the brain. What's important now to know is a word called synaptic pruning, which I'll talk I'll be mentioning on and off. Synaptic pruning means um, we gain experience and some connections are strengthened, others are eliminated. What that means is, let's say you were an A student in ADMATS in Form 5, you did exceptionally well. And now if I give you a, uh, 
question from an admits textbook, you might probably be shocked. You might be uh, you might be wondering how I can't remember this now. I why? And that's because you haven't lost the connection, but the synaptic pruning has reduced. So if you look at that question, you'd be able to learn it again much quicker than the first time you did. And it's because you haven't lost the channel. So synaptic pruning is that the more you use a certain pathway, the more easier it is for your hippocampus, hippocampus, sorry, to uh, locate that piece of data and tells you where how to use it. Okay, so synaptic pruning is another thing which you need to pay close attention to. So following this, the next concept you need to know before we go into memories is how our neurons communicate with one another. So it communicates through brain waves. Brain waves then form electrical signals. These can be measured as alpha, beta, theta, delta, gamma. So these are just brain waves. It's just how our brain communicates, how neurons communicate one neuron with another. So what's important here is when your brain is in a state where it's um, the waves are slow. It's called delta brain waves. You're usually asleep at this time. So when you're sleeping, that's when your brain activity um, uh, slows down and you go into a delta state. Then there's a second state when, which is when your brain activity is a little bit faster. It's called the theta brain waves. When this is produced when you're falling asleep, daydreaming, and theta brain waves. The important part about this is. Studies have shown when you are in a theta state, you are most, um, uh, this part of the brain, you're most, you can creative, this is when you are the most creative uh, aspect of yourself can happen at this part. And there was an experiment done by someone called a painter, Salvador Dali. So what he did was he used to sleep with a big, it's called the Salvador Dali experiment where he slept with a big spoon. And as he was falling asleep, the spoon will drop and he enters a theta state and he wakes up and he starts painting what he sees. And that form of painting was called later called surrealistic painting, surrealism, what you see in a dream. And he had lots of discussions with a psychoanalysis expert called Sigmund Freud. You might have heard of him as well. So. Freud was very into dreams, and they found out that you get creative by just um, activating a theta, and that's how Dali did it in his time. I'll talk to you about theta brainwaves a little bit later. The next wave is alpha brainwaves, is when you just wake up. Your mind is shut off, your prefrontal cortex is just awake. This is when you're most focused, but no activity is happening yet. So that's an alpha brain. And I'll tell you something about an alpha state of mind after this. The next wave is brain. Next brain wave is called the beta wave when you're awake. This is a little bit of a faster wave. There's low beta waves, which range between 12 to 15 hertz when you are thinking and solving small problems. Then there's medium range beta waves, which range from 15 to 22 hertz. That's when you're performing some activities, when you're focusing, trying to do some work, you go into that state. And then there's high beta waves, which are more than, about, more than 22 hertz. And this occurs when you're doing complex tasks. So more communication occurs. And then the, the last state is gamma, which is the highest frequency. It's associated with high level thinking, focus. And what studies have shown people with very, very high IQs get into a gamma state much faster than an average person. But you can train yourself to get into that state. So now, the next thing which I want to talk about is called entrainment. Entrainment is a, a just a way, a simplified way to say that, the, a way to guide the brain gently and safely into these brainwave patterns. And that's what they did to... Uh, learn more about it. I'll talk about entrainment also a little bit afterwards. So just a small mention of something called an alpha state of mind. So if you pick up a book which says by a yogi or some guru or famous speaker like Anthony Robbins, they all talk about an alpha state of mind. What exactly it means is it's the part where you are most focused. Does it Improve cognition? No, because we know theta now does. But 
This is very important because before you start any work, if you are in this state of mind, you tend to absorb more, you tend to retain more. So all your short-term memories tend to convert to long terms in a much more smoother way when you're in an alpha state of mind that has been uh, clinically proven. So this experiment uh, showed us that theta waves were actually, if you were in a state of theta, uh, so what they did was, uh, which I mentioned earlier, entrainment, entrainment, so they used lights and sounds to put patients in a theta uh, state and then tested them. And they did various tests and those who were in that state performed much better. So this test was done nearly in, in 2019 or 2018 and it proved Salvador Dali's theory where you are in a theta state, you're most creative. So this is just a test which I just wanted to bring up to mention. And we know now that when you are entering theta, you're the most creative part of yourself and you can probably come up with better solutions in, if you need it. Okay, so it's just something which uh, evidence has shown us, I've just put it a little bit on this slide, where they study people who are meditating, they found that um, they had increased gamma waves. Um, those uh, who ate certain nuts tend to also produce gamma and delta waves, but they could not control them, but they just noted that it's produced. But does nuts really help? No one knows. And music. So what happened with certain stimuli, they call them binaural beats, which I'll talk a bit later on, tends to put you in an alpha and a theta state. That's an entrainment on its own. So that's what science has told us. So now that we know how memories are formed in all its ways, let's talk about brain supplements or snake oil. Snake oil is basically rubbish, which doesn't quite work. So many times people say, okay, if I'm a Hollywood superstar or I'm very rich or I'm a CEO in effect and I have so much money, what type of supplements is the best in the world, the most expensive, the most luxurious supplement which I can buy? Uh, is there such a thing? Of course there is. So this is what it is, Lima. So Lima is a company which has uh, is packaging um, high-end supplements in these copper cased vessels and if you apparently what it does is some of the nootropics which I'm going to talk about is packaged in a, the best formula in these drugs but it causes you an arm and a leg does it work no studies have said so but it does package it well and it's something if you want if you have a, have the money to buy you might want to look at it the next thing is could it be snake oil or brain supplements is something called pyrocytam. Now, pyrocytam, it was very famous because lots of patients with traumatic brain injuries were given this. And there were some studies, very controversial, if you actually looked at the data, which said that it worked. Of course, it worked a little bit, but time also works. So we don't know whether it's actually pyrocytam that worked or this, but the bad part about pyrocytam, if it was tried on normal patients, normal people, well, they took paracetam, they did not perform better in an IQ test, they did not perform better in memorizing, but they exhibited anxiety, stress, and, and so on. So do note the patients on this can get anxious, can have some side effects, which will interfere with your prefrontal cortex. And the first part in your short-term memory may be affected, which is your concentration. So be careful of paracetam. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but I'm not saying it works either. Next thing is something called NeuroAid. It was very famous after Pyrocytam had come out. It was, uh, it's got some crazy things like scorpion venom and other things inside, and lots of Chinese studies which say it works. It's wonderful. It's this. It's that. But there were all uh, holes in most of those studies if you look at it carefully. It's, it's no proper evidence that it works. Where Side effects were concerned, not much, but whether it works, not much evidence, but still it's marketed and sold quite extensively and not sure whether it's snake oil. Then comes ginkgo biloba. 
ginkgo among them has been known to work. Yes, it does work on working memory. But the problem with ginkgo was there was a large study which was done that showed that ginkgo caused strokes. And how it caused, nobody really knows, but it did. And another study showed that ginkgo actually reduced uh, so the effect of certain drugs like statins, benzos, some other drugs. And currently they're marketing ginkgo in the form of something called tanakan, which is the active ingredient of the ginkgo plant. Whether that works better, there's no strong evidence to today. So just be careful of that. And the last thing which I'll put there, brain supplements or snake oil, would be this one. Brand's essence of chicken. Everyone who goes for an exam, some grandmother will say, drink a glass of brands and you'll do well. Does it work? A study done in China says yes. It um, showed that some patients improved their concentration in terms of remembering uh, episodic semantic memories. No. Then there, I came across another paper by UKM, if I'm not mistaken, which had a large study on patients who took brand's essence and they said it worked. But when you go through that paper, oh, there's a, there a lot of questionable things came up. So I still cannot um, say that is something with evidence, but maybe it does help a little bit in the prefrontal cortex where concentration is uh, key. But whether it's snake oil, likely. But we don't know. So now let's see what actually works with medical fact. So the first thing which works and is something called omega-3 fatty acids, which all the tests done showed that it improves patient, uh, cognition in patients with Alzheimer's and it reduced the risk of cognitive decline. So these, uh, this omega-3, the caveat for this was there is no single omega-3 supplement, 1,000, 1,500 milligram, which was equivalent to the actual fish. So the study actually came out when they studied Eskimos and they found out that these Eskimos were not getting strokes, not getting heart attacks, and they, it was basically from fatty fish which they ate. So the best source of omega-3 is not from a pill, but it was from fatty fish itself. And the types of fatty fish we have is sardines, um, cod and salmon. And shockingly, sardines are the safest among the three because it doesn't consume mercury and other toxins for some reason. So it's a safe fish and it's also safe from the tin. So eating sardine from tin is not so bad, even though it's cheap, but it's a cheap alternative. So having two servings of fatty fish a week is evidence to improve cognition. How it improves, it helps with episodic memory. It helps with uh, structural neuroplasticity. The next thing which I want to talk about is called creatine. Creatine is actually uh, an amino acid found in meats. It, your body also produces it. Um, the Journal of Nut uh, Nutrition actually did an article which says it actually improves uh, cognition, reduces neurodegeneration. Problem with this is um, too much of it can cause kidney damage, but it's fairly good evidence that it works and it can come out from a pill as well. You don't need to get it from meats and vegetables. Then we have caffeine. Caffeine, very well studied, especially journals in French, in France, had shown that it improved cognition in patients with mild cognitive uh, decline, patients with Alzheimer's. But there was a caveat for this as well. Not more than 400 milligrams of caffeine because it had a opposite or a contradictory effect when you took more caffeine. So 400 milligrams is about uh, five, four to five cups of coffee, depending how strong your coffee is. More than that, it may have caused anxiety, interrupts your prefrontal cortex, your um, cognition to your working memory is affected if it's too much. But at the right doses, yes, caffeine works. The next thing which works is l theanine L-theanine is found in green tea. Lots of studies in Japan that showed that they did well in the elderly. And it's actually something that works. Which part of the memory, we're not very sure, but it actually does improve. And there's a lot of evidence on this. Also found in some black tea, some mushrooms. But green tea was the selling factor when 
um, the study in general of neuropharmacology came out. Then vitamin D, a 2017 study, which was a large study in a geriatric population, showed that they all did better cognitively. And it's still something worth taking 800 per thousand international units. There is a lot of evidence for it. It slows down your decline. That's what studies have shown. And then we have resveratrol. Resveratrol is found in red wine, red grapes. It's in the tenants there. And this, for some reason, slowed down the deterioration of your hippocampus, the librarian in your brain, which tells you where information is kept. So it's something which actually very few drugs do it. And resveratrol was one of them. Then lion's mane, since 250 years before Christ, they were using this for some form of medicine, one way or another. The Journal of Ag uh, Agriculture, Rural and Food Chemistry has said it has some neuroprotective um, substances. How exactly? Not very sure yet. Then theobromine, which is found in cocoa, is something which has come out in 2024, the Journal of Functional Food. And this actually showed that it, um, it has properties to prevent neuronal damage. It enhances motor memory, cognitive uh, regulatory functions. What it means is yeah, structural neuroplasticity got better in patients on it. And the caveat worse, it has to be more than 70% cocoa to get the benefit. So the higher the num uh, cocoa level, the better it was This um, when this alkaloid was concerned. It did not get delivered the same way when it was put into a pill. So eating dark chocolates actually has some brain chemistry which works. Vitamin B6, 9, and 12 has been long studied for a very long time. Yes, good evidence to show it sh uh, slows down neurodegeneration. It is, uh, it tends to, what people say, uh, studies actually show it helps with myelin. So in, in a way, it helps with um, how information is delivered and um, this is, actually helps in what I told you about pruning. And the last part is magnesium. Since a study, in, a very large study done in 2022 showed, uh, looked at 2,500 patients ages 60 and above, those who took magnesium performed better. They had better semantic memories, better uh, short-term, better long-term memory. So it was, it is something which people are looking at now in Alzheimer's patients. And finally, we have uh, phosphatidyl serine, which has some evidence. Not it's very sketchy papers on this. And the last one is called uh, ashwagandha, which is found in Lima. Lima, which is that high end vitamin, and people are selling it now in other forms. This has um, shown very very good improvement in patients with mild cognitive impairment. So. That's all the supplements right now with evidence. So now let's look at something called music therapy. So there is um, evidence that music therapy actually works when you have Alzheimer's. So what it does is it, um, it helps with episodic memories in Alzheimer's. So there was this guy who was a TikTok user who joined the, um, some famous documentary people from BBC and came up with this documentary, A Life Inside, where he um, took music, which was from the patient's time. So the patient used to least listen to the Beatles. He would put those type of music into an MP3 and let them listen. And he found that it helped them improve their episodic memories. And if, if you watch it, you can see some of the changes. And this paper came out after that, showing that, yes, episodic memories do improve with some sort of music therapy. And then there is something else called the most relaxing song in the world, which is called Weightlessness by Mar Marconi Union. So what this is, 
uh, it has something which I told you about binaural frequencies. And there is strong evidence that this can put you in a theta state and reduce anxiety. So pe people are, uh, there were comparisons with benzodiazepines before surgery. Apparently this uh, music reduces your anxiety to a level where a benzo does. And this is used actually in some hospitals in the NHS now. So something to think about. Where now we are reaching this part of the talk, which is called cosmetic neurology. Oh, hang on, huh? someone. Okay, I just looked if there's any questions. No questions at this point. So I'm going to go through what cosmetic neurology is all about. So cosmetic neurology refers to the use of neurological interventions to enhance movement, mood, mentation in a healthy person. So it's a brain enhancer for someone who is healthy, not someone who is sick. So because of that, there's a lot of ethical issues that comes with cosmetic neurology. Is it ethical to give someone something to that can make you smarter? Cosmetic dermatologists have done that to make you look prettier, but can cosmetic neurologists do that to make you? So this has been a big debate, the ethics about it. And now I'm, you're probably wondering what's what's wrong here. What's the ethical issue? So let me tell you what the ethical issues are. So let's consider the following hypothetical case study. So let's say I've given up my neurological practice and I've become a cosmetic neurologist. So I only now treat healthy patients and try to make enhance them in any way I can because I see it's lucrative, it does well. So I get my first patient in. He's an executive. He comes in, he tells me I'm forgetting all the time. I can't remember things, certain things where I left my keys, what I well, what I did in work last night. I'm, I can't do it. I just, I'm just forgetting. I don't know why. It's never happened before. Then I take some history and I find out he's depressed. He's going through a big divorce and that's caused the depression. So I know he's... Uh, ability to focus, his prefrontal cortex is affected. I tell him this and I say that there's something which can help with depression, which is called cetron, it's SSRI, and there's evidence out there which tells you, tells me that it also activates the prefrontal cortex and helps you focus. And I tell him about the side effects and I prescribe it and he does wonderfully well. Then comes in the next patient. This person is a violinist in a famous orchestra going to perform in Petronas Twin Towers in the Philharmonic Malaysian Orchestra. And she's a violinist. And she comes to me with a newspaper article saying, lots of these classical players take beta blockers like an abusive before they play because they play better, they're more calm. Ask me about it, can I prescribe some of it? And I tell her about it, I say, yes, I'm very aware about these articles. And beta blockers do work, first and third generation, not second, because bisoprolol I and mean, metoprolol, they are second generations, they don't work that way. But first generations do, and third, propanolol, cavitidol. So I tell her about propanolol. I say propanolol is good, it calms you down. We know that it acts, uh, blocks the adrenal receptors in the heart and blood vessels, helping to control arrhythmias and blood pressure, but it also blocks the adrenal receptors in the brain. And, it may, and with this, it actually helps your uh, procedural memory. And it also makes you calm. And you won't get the nerves when you play. So I prescribe propanolol, and she plays, and she does well. Then comes the other patient. He says he's got the tip of the tongue phenomena. He's a, he's a speaker. He's a motivational speaker. And he says this time when he starts going for his talks and he wants to talk, he finds he can't get that word. Ah, oh, it's just it's not coming out, but he knows the word. And sometimes it, it's embarrassing when he's talking to a thousand people in a room. So he says, "Can I help him?" I say, "Yes, I can." Uh, there's something called uh, cholinesterase in a bit of donipazil. So donipazil, there was a study done on fighter pilots which showed that taking this made them react much better in situations where 
It involved emergency. So fighter pilots were doing better with this. And it helps light up all those dendrite uh, connections. That's what um, polynestrase inhibitors were shown to do. And that I felt it will work. And so I prescribed it. And yes, he spoke well without any more slip of the tongue. Then came an athlete. His father brings his son. He says, my son wants to, is running a marathon. And I'm worried. And is there anything that can help him breathe better? Um, so I tell him about sildenafil, which is used for erectile dysfunction. But studies also show that it improves oxygen, oxygen carrying capacity of cells. And he's likely to do well. I tell him the side effects. The father agrees and I prescribe it. And then comes another patient. He has, he's going to China to learn Mandarin. And he says, is there anything to help me learn and remember this language so I can come back and speak the best Mandarin in town? And I said, yes, there is something called dextroamphetamine. And dextroamphetamine was used since World War II to make soldiers alert. And there are studies that shows that it helps with working memories and it helps to convert working memories into uh, something long-term where you can actually recall much faster, which is called pruning again. So I prescribe it. He does well. He gets to speak Mandarin very well. And finally, a security guard comes in and he says, I work the graveyard shift and I cannot stay awake and I'm afraid I'll be fired if I don't do my job well. And what can I do? So I said, there is one drug. This will help you keep will keep you awake. You can function very well. And it's called modafinil. Modafinil was used, I tell him that it was used by the Navy SEALs when they went to hunt down Osama bin Laden. And modafinil has relatively less low side effects. It helps with even fatigue in patients with uh, post-stroke fatigue. So I prescribe it. He takes it and he's all swell ends well. So that's the ethical dilemma where cosmetic neurology is concerned. Is it ethical what I just did prescribing all this? Can it be done if the patient signs off? And that's the debate that's going on where cosmetic neurology is concerned. I, is it ethical? Is it right? Should we do it? Are we allowed to do it? And what's in the pipeline is something called empokinins. Empokinins uh, was first discovered in 1993. And what it does is it utilizes GABA in the brain and it helps you improve. It imp it's shown to improve acquisition form, formation and recall. So what, what that means is your short-term, long-term and neuroplasticity improves with empokinins. They've done mouse models on this and the mice were performing so well on maize, different different types of maize. And empokinins is being developed into drugs and it's going to come out soon as a cosmetic neurology drug. The next thing is Crab modulators. Crab modulators are cyclic adenosine monophosphates and they convert short-term memories into long-term memories. And that means you need to study a little bit and you can remember more. So that's being done as well. Problem here is drug companies are not picking this up because they are not catered for patients who are sick. They are catered for patients who are well. So insurance won't buy in. So that's where these drug companies are having problems. How are they going to market the drugs when it comes out? So what this is where I end with that thought on your head? Should it be, what is your thoughts on cosmetic neurology? Should it be practiced? Would you want to get your hands on empokinins and crab modulators? What are your thoughts? And I'll take questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vishnu, for the uh, amazing talk on the connective neurology. Uh, so, Dr. Shari, uh, are you around? Yes, yeah, very interesting. Um, I believe something that we actually have not uh, really 
has said before. Can we continue? I just want to ask, right? Um, when you talk about supplements, right? How any specific dose that have been used in the study? Uh, depending on what supplements, like vitamin D, they use doses of thousand international units. Um, the study for uh, omega three fatty acids, they use doses up to thousand five hundred, but they found um, three servings of fatty fish delivered more results. Uh, Ashwagandha, they said small quantities, but uh, they didn't specify how much. So there's a there are doses, but I, I suppose how it's marketed is fairly safe to say that's the dose which should work. How about your study? Do you practice any supplements? Huh. So I practice any supplements. I would may, maybe I would say um, vitamin D, coenzyme Q10. If I I didn't mention that, but coenzyme Q10, what they found was. Um, it, it is located in your mitochondria and it helps um, connections in the, um, let's say if you want to, if you're working memory, it actually helps, but all studies were not very positive on coenzyme Q10. The other thing is if you're on a statin, you have lower doses of coenzyme Q10 in your system and supplementing it should benefit you if you're on one of those. So I would say that is worth it. Vitamin B is worth it. Were to try and if I have money, Lima. There was a question there. What is the minimum duration needed for most of the supplement to show effects? Okay, so most of them say in six weeks you will see some effect. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take some vitamins, they will say it takes up to three months. If you are talking about the drugs which I mentioned on cosmetic neurology, those examples which I gave, which are true examples, which can be used, those are immediate. You can see effects immediately. So depending on what what your what type of drugs you would like to know. Yeah. So I think we have a quiet group. Any anyone else? Well, you mentioned about the brain wave activities. Is it the same like what we did in EEG? Yeah, so they actually did uh, put EEGs on those patients and then they did something called entrainment where they induce those frequencies to, and then put them on studies. So to get them into a theta state, they, they use flashes of light and certain sounds. And when brain waves were recorded in theta, they put them in, into a room to do the tests and they did much better. So, yeah, that's about it. Okay. I think there's no any other questions from the audience. Any question can leave in the Q and A box. Maybe we can answer later. All right. Hmm. There's two more questions. Maybe I can read the question. Any thought on the music therapy in ICU to calm patients in delirium? In delirium. Any thoughts on music therapy in ICU to calm patients in delirium? In del okay, so um, weightlessness um, actually helps with keeping a patient calm. But you have to remember, you can't play music on a patient with delirium because it will cause them to be more anxious and that will trigger them and it will uh, send the delirium to spiral it to something more dangerous. So music therapy, what we call background music is okay. So let's say we are studying and you have uh, something back on the background, which is slow, like um, they usually say classical music, that tends to calm you down. But if the decibels are a little bit loud, where you can... Um, consciously hear it, that causes anxiety. So if it's music therapy, something in the background which is soft can work. Um, the next question is, I hope that helped with that. Uh, 
How should we advise patients in memory disturbances is due to side effects of medication. So if, if you have memory disturbances due to medication, is there something we can advise? So a lot of patients, which I told you, who are on statins, if you start them on especially high-intensity statins, they would say, I'm forgetting where I left my keys. I'm forgetting this. I'm forgetting that. And people have attributed this to the low levels of coenzyme Q10. So what I would say, like in that case, if everything is individualized. So in that case, I would say supplement with some amount of coenzyme Q10 before starting the statins. So you tend to reduce that much of uh, that part of the side effects. Other drugs, which are neuroleptics, which crosses the blood-brain barrier, it affects your prefrontal cortex. So it is more of concentration issues. So concentration issues is usually you let it wash out. Modafinil tends to work, but it's not uh, licensed to work in that sense. But if it's not something in cosmetic neurology, yes, you get just have to let it wash out and activity tends to uh, wake up your prefrontal cortex. So, hope that one has helped. Sleeping pills, I told you it is a sedative, so it just affects concentration, doesn't affect cognition so much. The SEAL team use medication for performance enhancing. Any idea? <laughs> so, someone asked if our military uses any um, enhancing medication, so I wouldn't really know, but we, I doubt they do, because it would be illegal. Uh, any role in Parkinson's disease, dementia, any role, any role for, so in Parkinson's disease, your procedural memory is affected. So basal ganglia and those areas. So procedural memory is very difficult to retrain, but there's a medication called Neutropec, which is um, developed by Russians, and it is actually available everywhere in the pharmacy. That stimulates that part of the brain. There's some studies that show it improves, but because it was from Russia, there is no uh, RCT which actually um, supports this. Other medications which work, it is basically just vitamins. So I remember I told you, basal ganglia is not an easy place to um, uh, for neuroplasticity to happen. So it's all training and physical activity to help. So there have been studies discussing how lack of sleep contributes to dementia in long run. Is it high frequency night shift on any suggestion? So. This, there were two uh, schools of thought where there's a question which asks if lack of sleep can lead to dementia in the long term or cognitive impairment. So there are two schools of thought in there. So the first school was, they, they called it the Da Vinci thought because Leonardo Da Vinci had very short intervals of sleep. He did not have long intervals and he was a genius. So they say that you need to sleep when you're tired and not uh, too much sleep. There was one school of thought. The second school of thought says if you don't get more than six hours of sleep and uh, brain chemistry doesn't work so well. What we have seen now in terms of sleep studies, people who sleep erratically, that means they don't have a nice cycle where you're working in shifts, they tend to um, exhibit uh, mild cognitive impairment when they grow older. So yes, they actually tend to do that. But if you look at it, patients and people with mild cognitive demand, uh, impairment aren't doctors, if you actually look at the professional scale. So even though that study shows that it does, but uh, most doctors have erratic sleeping habits. For some reason, doctors were not, in, uh, were not, paid, uh, were not classified as the general public that developed mild cognitive impairment. So that's... Any role of Parkinson's disease dementia? I think we've answered that. Uh, okay, there has been a study discussing how lack of sleep contributes. Okay, we've done that. Okay, so. Yeah, I think we, you answered all the questions. Yeah. Okay. 
So I think we are good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishnu and Dr. Sharyo for this session. We will see everyone next week for the next week uh, webinar session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh -huh.